Believe it or not, chemists, we are on our very last topic of this unit. We are now going to focus on something called a neutralization reaction and titration. After today, you should be able to explain what a neutralization reaction is, write the corresponding formulas in a neutralization reaction, and calculate an unknown concentration of an acid or base using a titration. Neutralization reactions is a type of double replacement reaction that occurs between an acid and a base to produce water and a salt. And remember, salt is a term, just a generic term for any ionic compound. Here's an example. Predict the products in words and formulas and balance the equations. So for example, we've got sulfurous acid plus potassium hydroxide. Whenever we had an acid, we would have to change it to the original ionic name. So this would be hydrogen sulfite. Then in a double replacement reaction, we would see that hydrogen would combine with the hydroxide so that you form water and potassium sulfate. So they just switch partners. So this is in words. Let's try our formulas. So for the one down below, we get water, and then the leftover would be calcium and phosphate. So again, with the calcium and phosphate, you can't just take them and put them together. Make sure that you balance those charges. So you'll have calcium with a plus two charge and phosphate with a minus three charge. You should get Ca3PO42. To balance the equation, you can use the tally method but remember, changing water to HOH makes it a lot more simple. So I would suggest then to do the tally method by listing out all the substances you have on either side of the equation. So we've got calcium on the left, and then we've got hydroxide, hydrogen, and phosphate. You want to verify that you have those numbers as well. On the right-hand side, we've got 3, 1, 1, and 2. So it looks like calcium is the thing that's not balanced. So I'm going to put a 3 there, and that'll change the calcium to 3, and it also changes the hydroxide now to 6. On the right-hand side, our calcium is good, but we've got to work on the hydroxide. So we've got to put a 6 in front of there. That way that'll change the hydrogen and the hydroxide both to 6. So it looks like we still have hydrogen to balance here in the phosphate. So for hydrogen, it looks like if we put a 2 in front, that'll change the hydrogen to 6 and the phosphate to 2 and now we're balanced. In a titration, a solution of known concentration, called a standard solution, is used to determine the concentration of an unknown solution. So what happens during a titration is a known quantity of one solution is measured out and the other solution is added from a burette until the two solutions have neutralized each other. Basically, that means that the moles of hydrogen ions equals the moles of hydroxide ions. At which point, the two solutions have neutralized each other. That is usually called the end point of the titration. Or sometimes it could also be called the neutralization point. An indicator is often used to mark the end point of the titration. Phenolphthalein is a very common indicator that's used in acid-base titrations. It is colorless in acid and pink in base. This is a typical titration setup where the burette you have on top and there you'll have a known concentration of the base usually in that burette and then you'll have an unknown amount in the flask. You know the exact amounts, the volumes that you're adding together. You'll also have to know the concentration of one of the substances that you're doing the titration with. Hopefully you'll have some practice with this in your lab experiences soon. To calculate the unknown concentration of an acid or base using a titration, we need to use the following steps. First, as always, you have to write the balanced equation. Second, you have to convert the known molarity into the amount of moles using the molarity formula. Molarity equals moles over liters. You'll then convert the moles of known 
into the moles of unknown using the mole ratio. So notice it's similar to our stoichiometry unit. And then finally, you will use the molarity equation to figure out the moles of unknown and divide by the volume to get the molarity. So right now this is just in words and it probably sounds confusing. So let me show you an example. 0 0.025 liters of a 0.28 molar hydrofluoric acid solution is neutralized by a 0 0.047 liters of an unknown magnesium hydroxide solution. We want to know what is the concentration of the magnesium hydroxide. Okay, there's a lot going on here. So let's first do our balanced equation. That was the first step. So we're going to take the hydrofluoric acid, react it with magnesium hydroxide, and we get water and our salt, which is magnesium fluoride. We're then going to balance the equation. I find changing water into HOH makes that a lot easier. So we're going to put a 2 in front of the HF, a 2 in front of the water, and then everything else is 1s. Okay, so we're good with that. Another thing that you can do, which you don't have to do, but I find this is really helpful, extracting the information from the problem. So for example, underneath the substance for HF, I am going to write the volume of HF that I have and the concentration of HF that I have. I'm also going to write the volume of magnesium hydroxide I've added and what the concentration is, what I'm looking for. So now what you can do is you can very clearly see you have the information available with the HF to figure out how many moles of HF you have available in the reaction. So step one is to take the molarity and the volume and figure out the amount of moles of HF you have in that solution. So we've got 0 0.007 moles of HF. The next step is to figure out how much magnesium hydroxide is going to be reacting with that. So to do that, we need our stoichiometry. So notice that it is in a two to one ratio. So we're going to say for 0 0.007 moles of HF, there are two moles of HF for every one mole of magnesium hydroxide. So I'm gonna essentially divide that by two and you should get that 0 0.0035 moles of magnesium hydroxide is what is required to react with the hydrofluoric acid. But we don't want the amount of moles. Instead, we want the concentration of the magnesium hydroxide. And so that's why the last step is to say, well, if we have 0 0.0035 moles of it, if we divide it by the amount of volume that we added, we can then figure out what the original concentration was. And there it is, 0 0.074 molar. Let's do another one. So we've got 0 0.037 liters of a 0.195 molar hydrobromic acid solution. And you're told that it's neutralized by a 0 0.0536 liter of an unknown potassium hydroxide solution. What is the concentration of the potassium hydroxide? So again, we're going to write our equation just like usual and then balance it. The next thing we're going to do is extract the information from the problem. So under the hydrobromic acid, I'm going to write the volume and the concentration. And then underneath the KOH, I'm going to write the volume and the unknown molarity is what I'm looking for. I then can clearly see that the hydrobromic acid, I have that information needed to figure out the amount of moles of hydrobromic acid I need. So in this case, I'm going to use the 0.195 and then solve for the moles of hydrobromic acid I have available. The next step is to do the stoichiometry. So I need to figure out how much KOH is reacting with the hydrobromic acid. And this isn't too bad because notice it's in a one-to-one -one ratio, but I'm still gonna show the calculation. So I've got 0 0.0072 moles of HBr. One mole of HBr reacts with one mole of potassium hydroxide. So notice the moles are the same. So that makes it pretty simple on the calculator. So this tells you how much moles of potassium hydroxide had reacted. Now we need to calculate what the concentration is by knowing the volume that we added. So step three would be to use that 0 0.0072 moles and then divide it by the volume. And so when you do this calculation, you should get 0.13 molar potassium hydroxide. As long as you follow those steps, you will be in great shape to do your titration calculations. As always, this requires practice, so make sure you get your questions answered and make sure you practice using Worksheet 5.
Thank you so much for watching.